I feel I have to start by saying a bit about um, the science of climate change because of what's been happening across the world in the newspapers uh, recently. Basically, there are three positions on climate change and what its implications are for us. First of all, there is, of course, the view of the climate change skeptics. The skeptics hold either that climate change is not happening. If you check Nigel, Nigel Lawson's book, for example, a comrade of mine in the House of Lords, you'll find he says that climate change has stopped for the past few years, and therefore we can't be sure that it will resume again. Um, some skeptics um, accept that climate change is happening, but say it's not caused by human activity, it's caused by natural events in the wider world. There are various versions of climate change skepticism. Uh, this position is an important one, uh, not so much, I feel, within the scientific community, but certainly in terms of politics, because the impact of the skeptics um, on politics is quite profound more marked in some countries than others. But if you look at global opinion surveys since Copenhagen, which is not that long ago, you find uh, a marked shift in public opinion in many countries where people, um, uh, an increasing proportion of people no longer believe that climate change is either dangerous or caused by uh, human activity. So political implications are much greater, I think, than the scientific status, really, of the skeptics. But there are people writing books, you know, which are worth checking, uh, like um, this recent one by um, Peter Taylor, I think he's called, called The Chill. Um, we, you know, he was an environmentalist and he's now become a climate change skeptic. So there are scientists there who dispute the conventional wisdom. So that's the skeptics. Second, there is the orthodox position represented by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Um, which I'm sure everyone here will know has been collecting the research of hundreds of scientists, thousands of scientists across the world, produced four large volumes documenting the state of play um, with climate change and its risks for us. Very boldly put, you know, the IPCC says climate change is indeed dangerous. It is indeed almost certainly 90% certain caused by human activity. Um, by the advent of industrial civilization, which is spewing out greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. However, the IPCC tends to see the most serious dangers are some way down the line. It tends to focus on 2040, 2050, and uh, later when documenting the most dramatic uh, implications of climate change. There is, however, a third position. I think it's very important to know this because I don't think the public gets the same kind of representation of this position as it does of the climate change skeptics. And that's the views of people I'll, I'll call the radicals. The radicals are not um, like most of the skeptics and non-scientists, they are scientists. And they say, again briefly put, that things are much worse than the IPCC argues. Um, people like James Lovelock or um, James Hansen of NASA uh, representative of this position. For anyone's interested in these things, I'd strongly recommend taking a look at um, Lovelock's most recent book, um, which is called The Disappearing Face of Gaia, A Final Warning, um, in which he actually, he's critical of the IPCC for the same reasons Nigel Lawson is. He sees the IPCC as a kind of artificially contrived, partly political consensus. But whereas Nigel Lawson says this leads him to be skeptical that climate change is happening or is particularly dangerous, um, Lovelock reaches a diametrically opposed conclusion. Again, as you probably know, he, he says that the climate change was already on a path to wrecking devastation in the world. The radicals say that um, uh, the risks posed by climate change are more proximate, are more dramatic and more thoroughgoing than the orthodox scientific community says. They talk of tipping points in climate change. They argue that the past geological record shows that even within a period of 10 years, you can get quite dramatic alterations in the world's climate produced naturally. We're in danger quite close to doing the same thing through our own activities. So that if you look in, for example, Eastern Siberia in Russia, 
Um, the peat bogs have been frozen for millions of years. They are now melting. Underneath the peat bogs, there is buried masses of methane. Methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2, the one that all people ordinarily talk about, even though it stays uh, less time in the atmosphere. The consequence, uh, the radicals say, could be dramatic jump in global temperatures, producing untold uh, and uh, devastating uh, consequences, not in some remote future, but in the relatively um, short term. According to Lovelock, as I said, these, a lot of these things are already locked into the world system. You know, it, when you look at, I'm not a scientist, and not, not many scientists are climate scientists. I spent two years looking at the scientific literature as best I could, and it certainly seems to me that the radicals have a greater chance of being right as the skeptics. So you, you have to assess the implications of these things and try to reach a position. Uh, interestingly, the three groups have like different views of the Earth and what we're doing to the Earth for the... Again, I don't know how you assess these things, but they have a certain disturbing consequence. Um, um, for the skeptics, the, the Earth is essentially robust and nothing we do uh, can affect it. The Earth is indifferent to what we as puny human beings do, you know. For the orthodox um, community, scientific green type community, uh, the Earth is vulnerable and we're damaging it. We're damaging its ecosystems um, by our intrusions into nature. But for the radicals, the, the radicals see the Earth as, uh, as an active a being, as it were which will react violently to our intrusion. So they say what we're doing is like uh, pricking a wild animal with sticks and it's going to react violently to us. So that's a much more disturbing metaphor really of climate change and its implications for, it, for us. And my conclusion, you know, science is, is, is based on skepticism. You never know what might be discovered next, but so far as we can know with a very high degree of certainty, we can say the scientific evidence is pretty solid. It is very disturbing. We're on the edge of doing something that no other civilization could ever have accomplished um, or ever have been responsible for, which is not only potentially altering the world's climate in a radical way, but altering it in an irrevocable way. Climate change is quite different from a program like global poverty. Global poverty is a bad thing, right? And it will be a bad thing in 2050 if we don't uh, improve uh, the state of, state of affairs in the world at the moment. Climate change is not like global poverty, though, because once the greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere, we don't know of any way of getting them out of there, and most of them will be there for centuries. So we're on the verge, potentially, of doing something quite irrevocable to the world's climate. And you know, some of the most serious consequences are not actually the global heating effect. So I think you should follow Lovelock and talk of glo global heating rather than global warming because the metaphor is a stronger one, really. It, it's the incidence of much more violent, dramatic, and extreme weather conditions, which will have you know, quite well-documented scenarios, you know, disastrous consequences, especially as they interact with wor other world problems. And if we can't do anything about them, if this is a, you know, once they're there, they're there, that's a, a pretty fearsome prospect, I think. So my view is the world has to organize to contest climate change. Um, well, giving talks, I usually, you know, try and find a few jokes to tell. So I was looking for climate change jokes, but anyone who works in the climate change field will know, first of all, there are hard, hardly any climate change jokes which is the joke about climate change, I suppose, too serious to make jokes about. And everyone's probably heard the few jokes that there are, but I'll risk at least one, which is sort of ah, mildly funny. One planet is talking to another planet, and the first planet says, I'm not feeling too well, I think I've got Homo sapiens. <laughs> and the second planet says, oh, don't worry, that doesn't last very long. <laughs> Well, you know, I think, but I think the joke is real because, you know, having worked on this the last little while, it seems to me industrial civilization is in the business of subverting itself. It's come to a, 
a, a sort of existential crisis of which climate change is the most serious expression, but only one expression of, of the unsustainability of the world w which, we've, which we've created and which we're living in. Now, of course, the world community has sought to mobilize. Um, the Copenhagen meetings happened in uh, December. Um, I went and spoke in the first sort of opening bit of the conference. Copenhagen, whichever way you look at it, was a sort of fiasco. Um, because, to me, it wasn't even really very well organized. You had, all, you had 192 countries, you had 120 states leaders, everybody milling around all over the place, lots of people not being able to get into the events they're supposed to actually speak at. So it had a somewhat fiasco-like quality. I mean, there it was. More countries met than ever before. More states leaders than ever been to any other global event, you know, ending in a sort of fiasco-like thing. But I don't feel too bad about it because, again, if you check my book, <laughs> I never thought that Kyoto-style approaches would lead to a lot. I never thought that Copenhagen would produce uh, a serious and kind of radical agreement we need to contest climate change. It was very hard to get 192 nations to agree on anything. Copenhagen, to me, expresses the, the, the more general system of international relations we have at the moment, where we live in a much more interdependent world climate change being the negative expression of that, but where we simply don't have the instruments of global governance effectively to control the forces which we've unleashed and we've got to try to build them. The way to build them, however, is not, I think, through United Nations um, complete consensus style method. Kyoto has not had much impact on, on global emissions. We all know that. It took an awful long time to be ratified we don't have that time, so I always thought we needed a more experimental and fast-moving process, which for me could have gone on alongside Kyoto's style uh, agreements. As it is, the world stumbled into it almost by default because of the last-minute agreement that le led to the Copenhagen Accord. I won't say an awful lot about the Copenhagen Accord, but very willing to discuss any of these things afterwards with anyone who's interested. In brief, you know, the Copenhagen Accord is along the lines of what I thought we would always need if we were going to effectively um, try to combat climate change as a here and now problem. I'd stress again, it is a here and now problem. It is not a uh, lots of years hence problem. It's a here and now problem. It has to be dealt with reasonably quickly. The advantages of the accord over Copenhagen style uh, structures are fairly easy to see. You have a smaller group of nations involved, almost certainly, therefore can move more quickly. You cross-cut the division that existed, that destroyed Copenhagen, really, between the developed nations and the developing uh, countries of the world. As you know, the so-called basic group from which the EU um, did not figure, as everyone famously knows, I'm sure. The so-called basic group, because that's what the initials spell, involves the um, big developing uh, countries. We must have the big developing countries involved alongside the industrial countries to do anything effective. Um, only a handful of countries in the world produce something like 85% of total global emissions. It always seemed to me that the big polluters have, uh, had got to get together. Um, this was suggestion was actually made by uh, Mr. President George Bush was never really followed up because he was President George Bush, who seemed to be in a state of denial in other respects. But I think, you know, we are going to have to pioneer new structures in international relations. And we, climate change has to be both kind of an expression of this and a means of doing so. I don't feel completely um, pessimistic about it, but it's an open question. What will happen to the accord? How many countries will sign up? whether there will be any kind of legal, legally binding structure which emerges from it. Those things to me are desirable, but quite a lot of you know, bilateral and regional agreements are clearly gonna be necessary. If you follow what happened with the WTO, the WTO couldn't reach universal agreement. That wasn't a good thing. On the other hand, a lot of interesting things have happened because of that. You have got a lot of regional agreements you have got quite a lot of effective bilateral agreements. We're going to have to do the same thing willy-nilly for climate change. However, my main thesis is that
no matter what happens on an international level, it's no good having agreements if you can't implement them. So the core thing for um, trying to contest climate change is that you must have effective climate change policy. It's clear, especially in the wake of Copenhagen, although I must say I thought it was clear before, that a lot of this has to be led at the national level, and that therefore national policy will count for an enormous amount. We have to look at how it can be made effective. And we can also say that um, policy in the industrial countries will count for most because um, whatever happens to a structure of international agreements, uh, one of the things that is accepted across the world is that the industrial countries have the greatest historic responsibility for introducing greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Therefore, they have the um, frontline responsibility for cutting down their um, CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions in as rapid and as a radical way as possible. If you look at uh, what's happened since Kyoto, and you look at uh, the whole range of industrial countries, you can see why the leaders of the big developing states are not all that keen to sign up on agreements, because the record of the industrial countries so far is actually not terribly impressive in terms of what's actually been achieved and in terms of what, with what they were supposed to do, even with the relatively modest Kyoto targets. What you have among the industrial states is a cluster of avant-garde countries, which have done quite well in terms of active energy policy and uh, active reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. These would include the usual suspects of, of Denmark, Sweden, Germany, France, because of nuclear energy small cluster of countries, some of whom have um, a lot of hydroelectricity, um, like Norway, for example, although it doesn't actually have a very good um, emissions record, but nevertheless has a lot of renewable energy in its energy mix. You have a kind of avant-garde of countries which have done reasonably well. But even if you look at the avant-garde, um, why they've done reasonably well is not um, simply or probably even primarily because of climate change policy. Um, most of the countries that have got a high proportion of renewables in their energy mix have got them because they reacted to the first energy crisis um, of the late 1970s, early 1980s. In other words, they were driven by energy security considerations. This is when Denmark and Sweden started to rethink their energy policy. It's when Japan tried to improve its energy efficiency ratio. It's when France introduced a large-scale commitment to nuclear power and so forth. The disturbing thing about this is that it's taken about 30 years for these changes to happen. In the case of climate change, we don't have 30 years to make pretty radical changes in our energy mix. Beyond the, the small cluster of avant-garde countries, you have a long tail of countries which, without the impact of recession anyway, which has given us a kind of breathing space, wouldn't have reached their Kyoto targets. And you have plenty of countries which signed up to Kyoto where emissions have actually increased uh, pretty radically rather than declining. Um, in Europe, Spain, um, Greece, Italy are among those countries. In the wider world, Australia, Canada, and of course the United States. And Japan, because Japan, um, even though it has high energy efficiency, in some aspects of its economy, it has a lot of coal-fired power stations, therefore its emissions rose pretty um, generously during that period. But in some countries, they've risen really steeply over the Kyoto period. Of course, the United States did not sign up to Kyoto, but Canada did originally, and then simply later on said, well, we're just going to ignore it. Australia did, and it has radically rising emissions. So the historical record is not very good. We somehow got to make a much more dramatic impact politically, economically, if we're going to make a serious attack on these uh, issues. And there's a lot that can be said about that, but I limit myself to four main points about what I think we have to think about in the context of national political systems, their interaction with business and industry, if we're going to get a step change, really, in a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. First of all, uh, we've got to find a way back to a politics of the long term. When you're discussing energy and climate change, you're talking about 20, 30 year 
uh, cycle. You're talking to me about a return to planning. Um, planning, of course, went out of vogue during the, if you want to call it that, the neoliberal period of the past 30 or so years. Planning was not effective in Soviet-style situations, not very effective in this country either. But you can't have a 20 or 30 year perspective on politics without planning in some sense. Therefore, we've got to find a way of producing effective policy over the long term, which will somehow cope with the fact that technological innovation is not predictable, by and large. There are many uncertainties in, in technological innovation. We need plenty of innovation. We've got to try to achieve it. But by and large, we don't know where it will come from. The biggest innovations like the internet or whatever usually come out of the side field, not as a result of deliberate um, planning and interventions. A cluster of issues to be resolved there. There's clearly an overlap uh, between um, developing a long-term politics of climate change and a uh, response to the world financial crisis. Uh, many people, of course, are talking about a return of the role of government and the return of regulation. To me, very necessary, both nationally and internationally. Impossible not to say this is the case. However, to get it right, it seems to me we, it won't do just to transfer market relationships back to the state. We've got to find, as it were, a new relationship between the state and markets, not just nationally, but also on a, on a wider level. If I can give you a concrete example of this, um, I've been studying in some detail the insurance industry because uh, insurance is going to play a key role in adaptation to climate change. We've almost certainly got at least a 2% uh, increase in average global temperatures already locked into the system by what's happened. Um, we have to protect people against the consequences that are already there. And of course, this could worsen. If you look at um, examples like Hurricane Katrina, you can see that the state, even in, in a rich country like the United States, is not able to cover more than a small proportion of the uh, insurance which would protect people, especially poorer people, in the face of such catastrophes. Um, therefore, follows to me that the private insurance industry is going to have to play a major role in this. Um, we have to somehow find a way of uh, allowing markets to operate in the long term and making this effective. There are some very interesting things going on in the insurance industry. Um, some big insurance companies are now developing long-term catastrophe bonds. Um, these are based to some extent on uh, financial mechanisms which are currently uh, under a cloud, such as derivatives, because you have to have a lot of offlaying of risk if you're going to seriously uh, protect people, especially poorer people, in the future. But you can see some things emerging here. Bangladesh is especially interesting um, because in Bangladesh they're pioneering a sort of mix between low-tech and high-tech. Um, they're using, for example, floating gardens which allow you to carry on agriculture even during periods of flooding. They're organizing these through local kinship networks. But at the same time, they're develop developing insurance protection mechanisms um, based upon um, uh, high technology satellite tracking. We're able to track the path of storms much more accurately than, we, than even four or five years ago. And what determines the amount of damage in a, in a violent weather pattern is actually the path of the storm rather than just the intensity of the storm. I offer that as an example of what seems to me we need a lot of invention and experimentation in the relationship between government and markets here. To me, there's far too much emphasis placed on technology in the existing discussions of climate change. I mean, obviously it will be important renewable technologies, but we're going to need innovation on the level of international relations, social innovation, political innovation, just as much as we're going to need technological innovation. Second, politically, we have to find, as far as we can, a way of controlling political polarization around climate change. I don't feel one can insist too strongly that climate change is not a left-right issue. To me, it has nothing to do with left-right politics. It's an issue for the future of humanity. It's not about saving the planet, it's about saving a decent way of life for human beings on the planet. And it doesn't, to me, have any left-right dimension. However, um, there, there is a serious danger inside um, national political systems
that it does become polarized in that way. If and when it does so, very hard to see how you're going to get either effective climate change policy or long-term climate change policy. The most serious example where this is happening at the moment is in the United States where, you know, President Obama came to Copenhagen with nothing to offer, really, because he hasn't managed to get a climate change bill through Congress. Again, not surprising that the Chinese took the attitudes they did when uh, Obama came with a, a notional and low offer on the table. Um, what's happened in the United States is you've got almost complete polarization um, between Republicans and Democrats around the issue of climate change. You might have seen the research by the Pew Center, which is ongoing research on public attitudes to climate change. In the United States, not actually so different from here, now only about the low 30% of people believe that climate change is dangerous caused by human activity and um, threatens our future. Um, down from 50% about two years ago, almost all the people who've changed their views are either Republicans or independents, they're not Democrats. And what's happened in the United States is that a climate change package has been seen as an overall package which President Obama has tried to get through Congress, which the right doesn't like. Healthcare, socialist thing. Logical intervention in the economy, socialist thing. Climate change, well, that must be a socialist thing too. Well, I mean, it's, it's quite crippling because you know, we, we suffer from a lack of global leadership on climate change. And like many people, I was hoping that President Obama could provide that inspirational leadership. I still hope that he can, but structurally at the moment, it looks difficult. I think in other countries, we have to struggle to avoid this kind of polarization. In the UK, I think the same thing is true here. So far, we've been pretty successful because I spoke in um, several of the bills which have gone through Parliament. Um, the climate change bill, the energy bill, I'm speaking tomorrow in the um, bill on uh, management of floods, um, adaptation type uh, bill. We've had a remarkable consensus in Parliament on those. They, the bills actually became more radical rather than less radical. And as they went through Parliament, and all three parties supported them. However, supposing uh, the Conservatives do win the election, it's possible that they could experience similar kinds of tensions because you can see an incipient polarization between climate change skepticism, anti-Europeanism, a kind of right-wing view on world affairs, which, which could have an impact um, in the UK. So across the world, we have to try and hold the line if we can um, on political polarization, and I think uh, my view will be that the left um, has a, a special responsibility on this because the left has tended to see climate change and environmental issues as its issues. It shouldn't do that, I think. I, so I'm, I'm against uh, any theorems like green is the new red um, because that immediately, I think, that means that, well, the, the political right are not going to support um, that kind of theorem. So I think the issue of you know, political polarization very closely related to the issue of developing long-term policy. We won't be able to develop long-term policy if every incoming government reverses the policies which the previous one had. So it's quite a difficult and testing issue. Thirdly, we're, we're at a key point after Copenhagen where we have to muster enthusiasm for change. And um, I think it's become more conventional than it was in the past, but quite correct, I think. And I certainly argue in my book that it's not enough just to talk in terms of avoiding catastrophe. Avoiding catastrophe is difficult for the average member of the public to relate to. Partly because climate change is not visible. By the time it is visible, it'll be too late to deal with it. Partly because it's filtered through the findings of science, which are inaccessible not only to the lay per person, but to many other highly educated people not able themselves to be experts in that area. It makes it a difficult kind of issue. Partly because the public become inured to catastrophes. Catastrophe movies are everywhere. Hard to disentangle climate change from a variety of other catastrophic futures uh, that are presented to us. It therefore follows, I think, that we've got to have a, a much more positive view of what we can achieve through developing a low carbon economy and through having a sustainability agenda. I didn't see this as at all impossible. You'll probably know that um, the, the two 
American environmentalists, uh, Schellenberger and Nordhaus, became famous in the American environmental community when they said Martin Luther King wouldn't have got anywhere if he'd said, I've got a nightmare. You've got to have a dream of the future. You've got to have a, a vision of the future. I certainly think this is, this is true. A good chunk of it, to me, can be built around um, renewable uh, energy because uh, there is a pretty substantial overlap between energy security and climate change. And if you look around the world, who, who are taking the lead in terms of, of investing in renewables, it's not just countries like Germany, it is now China. It has for a long time been Brazil, where of course they use biofuels which are environmentally suspect, but nevertheless quite an avant-garde country. Uh, the same is true of India, now planning very large-scale investments in renewable energy. Driven, I think, partly by climate change worries, but mainly by energy security considerations. I think we're living at the end of the age of oil in one sense or another, just as I was saying over lunch, that we're living at the, I think, the end of, as it were, the American era. The 20th century was an American century and was the century of oil, really. I think that we're moving beyond that transition. I think political leaders see that like other people do and therefore are making large-scale investments. So this could be one driving force of change. Um, I think you have to insist, however, it's not enough. Uh, many people make the mistake of assuming that if you invest a high proportion of uh, your energy mix in renewable sources of energy, that you ipso facto reduce greenhouse gas emissions by an equivalent amount. This is not the case. It depends completely what happens in the rest of the economy. Um, you take the example of Spain, for example. Spain, for instance, Spain has a higher proportion of its energy mix uh, created by renewables than Germany does, but it has a much more steeply, or did have much more steep ascending curve of greenhouse gas emissions because of what was happening in the rest of the economy, which was a heavily construction-based economy involving extractive industries which generate a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. It follows from this, which would be my fourth point, that we must have, we must have at this point a new model of development, and that model of development must build on the discussion happening all across the world about the limits of growth as measured by GDP and the need to deal with a situation in which we're, as I said earlier on, living in an unsustainable world. Industrial civilization is nibbling away at the conditions of its own existence. It, we, we therefore, I think, have to imagine and think about a different world. And it seems to me that in the industrial countries, we must have a serious discussion of what growth means. Um, we know from the work of many economists that increasing economic growth does not necessarily increase welfare. The aim of a society politically should be to increase welfare. We've had the report from President Sarkozy's commission, but we've also had a very interesting one right from the centre of British government, or close to the centre, which is the Sustainable Development Commission. If you haven't seen it and you're interested in these things, um, you should check um, Tim Jackson's book called Prosperity Without Growth, Prosperity Without Growth, where he says we don't have a macroeconomics of sustainability. I think that is true. Therefore, I think an awful lot of intellectual and practical work has to be done to create one because we're veering on a trajectory which is, is a kind of dead-end trajectory. To me, the same thing also applies to the large developing countries. We have to have a new model of development there too. And I think having talked myself to both the Indian Prime Minister and Chinese top leadership, I think they're becoming more and more aware of this. I can see no way in which something like um, nearly three billion people can simply track the pattern of development followed in the West, even because of local environmental consequences, quite apart from climate change much too destructive. So I think there is much more of a consciousness that we we'll need an alternative model of development. And I think it, it, you know, it, it could be along a kind of mixture of uh, low-tech and high-tech uh, uh, lines that, that I mentioned in the specific case of Bangladesh, because say you're in an Indian community which still has a strong sense of community, do you necessarily want to have supermarkets built outside the city which will have the effect of increasing traffic, undermining community connections you have already. Uh, 
to me, therefore, I think we have to think about these things in a serious way. So I'm looking for a, a sort of revitalization of political theory at this point. And my label for this, which sounds paradoxical, I think, isn't, is what I call utopian realism. I think we have to think beyond the world in which we live at the moment. Therefore, we need a dash of utopianism in political thinking. However, since climate change is a real issue, which has to be addressed in the short as well as the longer term, it must be grounded in real trends, must be grounded in things that are really happening in the world. So I think all over the place, one does see examples of this. If you take the transition towns movement, for example, very interesting form of social uh, innovation. If, if for anyone, again, who's tracking these questions, I'd recommend John Ari's book, that's U-R-R-Y, uh, called Beyond the Car, where he argues that we're reaching the apex of a car-driven type society because the car was originally an instrument of freedom and mobility. Where is that when you're stuck in traffic jams all the time? What we're going to see is not just, as it were, the disappearance of the car, but the transformation of transportation systems. And he gives many examples from around the world where these are being pioneered on a local level, where, for example, you have smart card systems, whereby you can integrate private and public transport, and whereby urban spaces are created in such a way that you can radically lessen uh, dependence on the motor car. I think these things are part and parcel of what we as social scientists should now be working on. And rather than thinking of you know, utopian realism as opposites, I think it was as co a contradiction which one side feeds off the other. And if we can't manage this, I can't see how we're going to really generate an effective politics of climate change. You'll remember that a few years ago, Francis Fukuyama said we're at the end of history, by which he meant that we can't imagine any kind of society beyond the kind in which we live now. Well, my view is we must imagine such a kind of society but it must have a realistic tinge to it. Therefore, we're not at the end of history. We're really effective at the end of the end of history is where we find ourselves now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.